When do you start spraying the blossoms for powdering mildew? We start spraying when we can visibly see the panicles emerging from the stems. Even before they have buds particularly showing. Yeah, when the panicles are starting to come out, we'll start to spray once every seven to ten days for powdery mildew until they have set their fruit. When they've set their fruit, there is no reason to spray sulfur or, or horticultural oil or mill stop or whatever product you decide to use to control powdery mildew. But until that point, you better be spraying in a window period of every seven to ten days. You don't need to spray more frequently than that. But if you wait beyond 10 days, the effectiveness of most products diminishes considerably from our experience and uh, you'll start seeing powdery mildew again. So, um, yeah. and powdery mildew is actually not that difficult to control in our experience. You just pick one of those product classes, if you will, and stick to it. Most people don't spray anything to control powdery mildew and some years it's more severe than others. And if they don't spray, um, and it's bad, it can wreck your crop. Yep. I mean, totally wreck it. And that happened to a lot of people in Florida this year. Not just that's, here. In, that's a black mildew. No, that's uh, actually uh, more of a bluish gray color. And in the presentation that I was going to give, I had photographs to show you. Uh, I guess um, I can open it up and show it to you individually or whatever. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be able to see it from where most of you are standing. Um, and anthracnose is black, necrotic, and causes uh, damage to the blossoms and the fruit. Yeah. Powdery mildew really only impacts the, yeah. the, the blossoms uh, on mango. So it can cause some scarring and some marring on the fruit, but it's really not gonna contribute to fruit loss in a major way. Okay. Anthracnose fungus, on the other hand, can actually impact fruit up until it's about golf ball size or so. So if you're in a western part of this county, Loxahatchee, the Acreage, Wellington, Jupiter Farms, anthracnose is a bigger threat to your crop than it is for us, let's say from here over towards the beach. Uh, and that's because of differences in relative humidity which encourage anthracnose to occur. The further west you are, the more bodies of fresh water you have, the more vegetation you have, the further you are removed from the breeze that the ocean provides us and all those are going to contribute to heavier humidity and more anthracnose on your flowers and fruit. Anthracnose is harder to control than powdery mildew is. Usually takes multiple products to achieve pretty effective control over it if you're going to use a product to, to try to control it. So in most cases, if you're in an area that's pretty humid and anthracnose is going to be a problem, I tell people that you're better off planting varieties that are resistant to anthracnose naturally then you are thinking you're going to chemically control the issue in the long term. Now, that doesn't mean you can't chemically control, but most homeowners aren't going to. So, uh, and chemical control with anthracnose, you want to use different classes of fungicides, usually a strong copper fungicide rotated with a non-copper fungicide. So uh, there's organic products like uh, biological fung fungicides that are, um, you know, reasonably effective if they're applied a lot, but um, if there's a heavy disease pressure, they don't work as well. Uh, so examples of those are like Sirenade, Actinovate, um, Double Nickel 55. There's some oil-based products, essential oil-based products made from things like clove oil and uh, sesame oil and peppermint oil that have some effectiveness as well. Um, the synthetic products that you can... Neem oil is um, pretty weak in my experience and we don't use it. Um, you can try it. There's better oils. There's denser, better quality oils uh, for controlling disease, in my opinion, than neem oil. Um, synthetic products, uh, things like uh, Dacanel, Chlorothalonil uh, is the active ingredient in that. Um, Mancozeb, uh, those work pretty effectively, but they are synthetics, they're not organic, so if you're an organic gardener, you're not going to want to use those. Um, I personally don't spray those on my fruiting trees just because I'm the one that has to do the spraying and I don't want to expose myself to them, So, but I know they work. So if, uh, if you really want to control anthracnose, those are some options that you can throw at it along with a strong quality copper. Most of the coppers that you get from big box stores like Home Depot and Lowe's are garbage. 
Uh, I wouldn't depend on them, especially if I was in a really humid area. Uh, there are better quality coppers with higher metallic copper propylene numbers and a good number of them. Um, you know, a couple common ones are Coastside, Badge, um, and there's others. There's lots of different formulations of copper. So there's cuprous oxide, uh, there's copper sulfate. I could go on and on, but like uh, they, uh, they have different levels of compatibility with other products. So be careful about coppers and be careful about applying them because they can cause eye injury and uh, other issues if you're not careful. So anytime you're going to use a product to control disease, make sure you read the labels, read the cautionary statements and wear protective equipment or, um, you know, at least uh, long sleeve clothing, uh, protective eyewear, hat, that kind of thing. Do you worry about long-term buildup of copper? Yes, if you spray too much of it, it absolutely can build up in your soil. So that's one of the reasons why you want to rotate it with other products. And it's also one of the reasons why you, there's really no need to actively spray copper all year long or what have you. And there are groves in Homestead, for example, where copper got used way too much and it builds up in the soil and it can cause issues for your trees because it can actually kill the beneficial fungi in your soil or limit its activity, if you will. And there is beneficial fungi that helps your plant and not just your mango tree. Lots of other fruit trees too are going to depend on that beneficial fun fungi. So if you spray copper all the time, you will kill that beneficial fungi and you can cause uh, excessive copper to build up in the tree too. Um, so I would suggest limiting your copper applications to your mango trees and um, the effort to control disease. Uh, you'll be spraying with another product, hopefully during the bloom and fruit setting period. And then most of the time after the fruit's golf ball size, you don't necessarily have to spray it until it's mature if you're trying to keep anthracnose off the fruit. But most of you are just growing in your backyards. So since you're not trying to achieve super pretty mangoes, you just want to get fruit. You can usually stop spraying your copper when the fruit are about that big. The fruit develop a natural immunity to fungus for a period of time uh, because of the, um, uh, the phytochemicals that are given off by the developing fruit. So um, now there are some cases and certain diseases where that's not true. But for anthracnose and mangoes in Florida, that's generally the case. So you'll think about spraying them up until that point, and then you can cut it out. And um, if you do it that way, you shouldn't see too much copper buildup in your soil. But the sulfur doesn't help anthracnose? Sulfur does not really have any effect on anthracnose at all. I see that myth quite a bit. Uh, sulfur is really just to control powdery mildew, and it has some effectiveness against um, Mite. mites. And it actually has some effectiveness against sooty blotch and fly speck, but that's... Not something for backyarders to be too concerned about. That's a commercial grower issue. I'm using the micronized sulfur for the, the lychee mite, and it's working on the mild micronized sulfur. It's will work on, on that. But works it won't on work on it. Won't work on that. Will not work on anthracnose. It'll work great on powdery mildew. Okay. Uh, if you are good about spraying sulfur in that seven to ten day window that I talked about, you should not see much powdery mildew. We use sulfur. That's and the nice thing about sulfur is most sulfur products are also organic. Uh, so, uh, it's, I mean, every product you have to read a little bit about and know about the hazards and it can cause irritation to skin and stuff like that. But I don't feel unsafe using sulfur, um, especially in the amounts that we use. And we get hardly any powdery mildew. As bad as powdery mildew was this year, we had barely any on our own trees because we use sulfur to control it. And, uh, we ended up with a decent crop. So there you go. What are the weather conditions that contraindicate the time of day and whatever that you can spray sulfur? You're not supposed to spray sulfur if it's pretty hot. So like in the upper 80s, that rarely happens during our bloom period anyway. And uh, besides that, I wouldn't suggest spraying if it's very windy, just because you're going to lose a lot of product and it's going to get blown into your face and that kind of thing. Uh, other than that, you don't want to spray sulfur if oil has been sprayed recently on your trees. So if you use horticultural oil to control piercing, sucking insects or whatever, you do not want the, uh, the sulfur to hit that oil because it can burn. 
Or do you have any comment on sulfur? Uh, yeah, yeah. Two week waiting period from spraying oil to you spray sulfur and another two weeks waiting period before you spray oil again. So, uh, most of us would rather choose one or the other to use during the season and, and not really do the alternating thing because it's too much to keep track of. Uh, another thing about copper is that it's great to fight anthracnose, but it has very little effect against powdery mildew. So what he was saying about sulfur, you know, the same is true conversely about copper. So you're spraying for two different things for those.